Sure, sir. Morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, what we have done is, you know, last time we had talked about the uh, evolution of uh, the reforms policy. We talked of uh, the World Bank conditionalities and the kind of uh, uh, financial distress that uh, we were into. And then we said it was necessary for us to initiate the reforms, partly for our own sake and partly also because uh, I'll just switch off the light at the back. Give me one minute. Hello. Uh, it's okay now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So, as we said, uh, partly because of our own and partly because it was uh, thrust upon us by the World Bank and the IMF, telling it very bluntly that uh, if you need our assistance, these are the policies that uh, you need to initiate. And those policies, the World Bank uh, and the IMF call them structural adjustment. In India, popularly it is known as the LPG. So let us start with uh, this term proper LPG now and then in today's session we'll also discuss about specific sectoral measures taken in terms of industry, banking, insurance as we go along. Fine. So basically, uh, one thing I like to make clear that earlier from 1956 onwards, we had a policy where basically government was in the driver's seat. So government will decide which industry, what capacity, location, you know, all, what capital, everything was decided by the government. And then it was realized or it was forced to be realized that it is not the business of the government to be in business. You provide good governance, you provide good administration, you provide a good ecosystem, that is fine, but for the, you know, for your own sake, don't be into business because it is not your business. So it was uh, accepted that uh, government will have to come out of business and that is where the liberalization start. So 56 onward, certain areas, as we'll discuss in the industrial policy, only for the public sector. Now, the government role was marginalized. Let me clarify at the very initial stage that when I say liberalization, I don't mean that the government has given up everything that the government was doing. The meaning of liberalization is that if the government was there 100%, the government will be there, but maybe 20, 25% more leverage and more leeway would be given to the private sector and the government role will be more toward the policy and the back-end uh, supporting uh, part of it. We'll find that the role government and the public sector business was marginalized, like, you know, state transport. Not necessary that only the government uh, corporation should be there. Airlines, not necessary that only the government should be there. Steel, it is not necessary only for the government to set up steel mills. So we'll see that as we go along. So role of government and public sector uh, business was marginalized. It was not totally closed. I repeat, the government would not actually run a business but regulate it effectively. So what the government did, as we all know, after 91, 92, you'll find that there was a slew of uh, control mechanism or regulatory mechanism that was created. So capital market, there were liberalizations opening up. But at the same time, the government created a very strong regulator in capital market known as SEBI. Similarly, the insurance sector was opened up. Private Indian foreign companies were allowed. But at the same time, the government also created a regulatory insurance mechanism. Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India, as you call it. Same thing happened in telecom. It was not BSNL or MTNL anymore. We had a lot of companies coming in. But... To regulate them, the government created TRI. Then we had banking, again opened up the private sector, but at the same time, the government also created board for uh, banking supervision, as we call it. So government had not given up the role. Only thing is 100% will not be there. 20, 25% policy regulatory mechanism with the government, operational part of it, who will start, where they will locate, what activities was left to, the private sector. I hope this concept of liberalizing is quite clear. Then, you know, uh, in fact, if I may give a slight uh, background, this particular idea of uh, liberalizing actually, in a way, started uh, during the period of Reagan and uh, Mrs. Thatcher in uh, UK and US. 
they went a bit further when it, they talk of liberalization they also introduced what is known as privatization in india it has not happened i'll discuss that when we talk of this investment and divestment in uk particularly what they did was you know the government was there in stay uh, coal or steel the government actually sold off those government properties or government units to private sector that is known as thatcherism and president reagan of course was a very staunch supporter of only private sector core capitalism as you call it so these terms those days came to be known as thatcherism and reaganism uh, in the usa thatcherism in the uk uh, after mrs thatcher who was the then prime minister basically what it meant was either you are transferring ownership from the government or public sector to private sector or the ownership of the public sector or the government will be diluted that is you know state bank for example if state bank is 100% owned by the government then 30% 40% of the equity will be sold off into the market so the government will not be the sole owner management and control will be with the government let us be very clear about liberalization let me touch upon this investment and divestment now as part of liberalization privatization is not going to happen much i'll touch upon it when i talk of divestment so this investment basically uh, was part of liberalization as i said where part part i am repeating not whole but part of the public sector ownership equity was either sold or transferred to private investors or what do you call institutional investors like lic or gic or you know merrill lynch and uh, those those kind of jp morgan uh, tebridden those kind of foreign investors also then of course uh, the purpose was again as we said the basic problem in 91 92 was government was uh, on the shoe strings it didn't have money critical uh, problem so idea was to get funds from exchequer curtail deficit and make effective use of these funds which government get for social sector then there are also problem of what do you call political intrusion or politicization of the public sector it had actually you know if i may use the word it had become adda for both politicians in power and also the uh, union communist i mean basically political parties into the labor unions kind of thing the idea also was that the government should not be on business but it should focus and facilitate more on the social sector development part of it and of course the idea was that the public sector unit should not be managed and dominated by the bureaucrats but it should be provided with professional management and of course better uh, customer service i i don't know if some of you are aware you know in india uh, people who are working with government we call them public servant no i mean i do some training for yashoda and uh, some government uh, institutions and when you talk to them you know you you find that uh, some of them are uh, so dominant they say sir public servant matlab kya hai as it is i mean public servant you want to service so your job is to you know serve the public he said sir wo theory mein theek hai but actually you know treat public as servant that's a typical british legacy you know koi hai kind of uh, culture so idea was that because there was a monopoly the public sector undertakings never bothered about the quality never bothered about the costing and customer actually customer service or customer was the last thing on their radar after 1991 the idea was the i mean basically you should do look for and work for the customer kind of thing so that customer orientation was also necessary to be brought in in terms of service products costing in benefits actually so these were the basic objectives of uh, this investments then just the some statistical part of it uh, in uh, 1991 roughly there were around uh, 250 236 to be more precise public sector units and out of this almost i mean 120 around were making profits and the government at that point of time those prices had blocked our 2 lakh crores uh, in as investment in this public sector units then when i talk of profit sector or profit making units in the public sector the statistics show that top 20 profit making public sector units mostly they were like bhel and oil companies mostly 
the top 20%, the top 20 numbers, huh, profit making units contributed 80%. That means out of uh, the 123, and around 100 companies, public sector units, contributed for the remaining 10% uh, of the profits. What do you got? Maybe they followed the 80 20. 80% profit coming from the 20 units. And then, of course, uh, another, again, finance, you know, money is, there's investment, so there must be ROI. So that point of time, it was also noted that in 1991, the government was getting roughly around 2% return on the investment that the government had made. That this 2% is even less than what normally we get on uh, current account. And therefore, you know, the public sectors, what's being referred to as what is known as uh, the white elephants. White elephants, you know, is more uh, showpiece. It doesn't really serve much. And obviously, so you can afford when that luxury when you have a lot of money. But when you are not having it, you can't pretend money. And therefore, there is a need for disinvestment, which happened after 1991. And as I said, because the government was on shoestrings, fiscal deficit had to be controlled. God, I mean, the resources had to be generated. The situation had to be rectified and if i may use a typical uh, management control term the public sector units had, had to be converted into profit centers rather than investment centers that means basically they had to create some kind of surplus on their own rather than depending on the government to take care of uh, the losses that they were making from the budgetary allocation therefore the disinvestment was adopted and implemented Again, uh, you'll also find that, as I said, what happens is the government is able to release part of the frozen value, like, you know, state bank. Let us say the market share, government invested 100 rupees per share, let us say. Today, the market uh, price is 800. And if the government sells off 40% of the equity, obviously, the government will not get 40% uh, uh, revenue at the rate of 100 rupees. They will get at 800 rupees. So that's how. The value, hidden value, as you call it, a frozen value was released. Uh, some, of course, you know, people did not like it. Typically, uh, what do you call uh, brainwashed people, as we call it, or uh, very uh, close minded people say, Are, what the government is doing is they are selling uh, crown jewels. But that's personal opinion. I will not uh, enter into that agreement as of now. The fact is that the government needed money. The fact is, 2 lakh crores were blocked, you are getting 2%. The fact is 20% of the profits were coming, 80% profits were coming from 20 numerical units. This had to be rectified. So the government adopted this policy. And uh, if, if I may just give an idea as to how much money the government was able to mobilize because of disinvestment, I repeat, disinvestment does not mean government selling off the business. Disinvestment only means government cutting down on its ownership. It will not be 100%. It will be 60, 70. Control, management control will be with the government. I repeat. So as I was saying, the government was able to release the frozen value. And uh, till December 18, uh, I got data till that, the government was able to mobilize something like uh, 4 lakh crores. To be more precise, uh, 3 lakh 82,971 82, crores that the government was able to mobilize by sale of uh, part sale of this equity which the government had in the public sector so that means over the years the government was able to mobilize 4 lakh crores for the exchequer and then can be used for other purposes then as i said uh, another was what is known as divestment now i like to appreciate the basic difference between uh, disinvestment and divestment Disinvestment, as I said, is where the government retains the control, majority and the management. 30, 40, even you know, up to 49% of the equity could be sold, but divestment is a different ballgame altogether. Divestment actually happens when the government sells off the total ownership or equity in that particular unit to private sector. It has not happened in many units, but some of you know, if I may give you an example, uh, Bharat Aluminium Belco, for, for example, was uh, was sold lock, stock, barrel to Sterlight, IPCL Baroda. They had a plant in uh, Nagotne in Maharashtra also. So IPCL was uh, sold to Reliance. CMC, I, I, I don't know how many of you have heard of this. CMC is a basically computer uh, consultancy firms. They were the ones who had uh, developed the first 
railway reservation uh, systems okay so basically core uh, uh, in today's parlance core it company that time it was computer maintenance corporation that was the name so cmc was sold to tatas tcs actually acquired then we had vsnl that was again uh, sold to that time tatas air india had hotels in santa cruz and zuhu these two hotels were uh, actually sold to sahara group and today you know, if you go to uh, the western express highway or you are going to domestic terminal in santa cruz you will find that uh, circular uh, i think this the sahara star hotel that was earlier air india property that means public sector which was sold off to sahara then there was a very small unit uh, in delhi known as modern bakery they were the first to introduce the slice bread in india that was a public sector unit which was again sold to uh, hll now hul so these were few exceptions where the government has actually sold off 100% its uh, equity and uh, control so this is known as divestment i am sure you are very clear about the word divestment and disinvestment divestment 100% sale off okay disinvestment government retains management and control again this was part of liberalization as we call it okay then sir, as i was saying uh, excuse me sir uh, sorry i am not rushing through uh, yeah a question uh, so when uh, when the government uh, uh, disinvests and what if the government's share is only about say less than 50% so still they have control over it or no 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 see no see like i mean one example i like to give in this context is maruti for example government had around 50 point something and suzuki had about 49 something was just neck to neck kind of thing today the government is not really controlling maruti because the government share has been brought down to 8% so ultimately see in any corporate the control will remain on how, who has the majority in terms of share capital so when the government share comes below 50% obviously the control will go to those parties or to that client which actually has a majority share holding so share holding will be the criteria in such cases when i say disinvestment what i yeah is that okay yes sir It's hello yes, okay sir. fine so as i said you know uh, in india divestment uh, is not really uh, feasible basically for uh, political and social reasons because the moment government starts selling off ipcl you know there are feeling ki government is going to privatize and it is going to harm the labor unions social sector so the socio political uh, ecosystem will really not allow india to go for divestment but disinvestment marginalizing the government share but controlling public sector is something which we have seen happen after 1991 as part of uh, liberalization Fifty. Then, what is the no, uh, purpose of it? Just no, no. Sometimes, like no Maruti, for example, they have kept eight percent just for the sake of it. Ideal thing is normally the government want basically idea is professionalization, and if the government feels that if they control forty percent and other person is able to take care of sixty percent control, but follow the policies that the government wants, government might agree with it. Again, you know, you got to think from the private sector. union uh, kind of there there is bound to be some chucking off of people that has to be accepted so government partly bureaucracy partly welfare and it takes time you know for people and political uh, opponents also to accept that yes this is a necessary evil part of it so normally government like to have control as of now very few exceptional cases have they divested kind of thing as a policy is that okay so what you mean to say is that Uh, disinvestment most of the psus which was carried out government uh-huh. continue to retain a 50% plus uh, uh, share in that most of them yes basically control management and what you call the majority share holding because that entitles government to have uh, control and management got it see see for example you know if you look at bank state bank for example the public sector bank corporation bank okay but do we could you say that these banks are now 100% owned by the government 
or are there private shareholders also? Sir. Huh? So that is basically uh, government wants to, as I said, government wants to release the frozen value and get money. And as we said, uh, they have got almost 4 lakh crores out of this uh, investment. Investment is totally different. Uh, we say exceptional cases only. Can I move? Yes, yes. Okay, chala. Now, what I'll do is, uh, is almost 8.40. We have about uh, 20 minutes. I'll do is, I'll, we'll now start touching upon the sectoral policy. Uh, basically, start with the industrial part of it. Again, extension of liberalization. And again, as we had said earlier, paradigm shift. We had moved from license to delicensing. So, these are the typical measures initiated by the government. Delicensing, decontrol, deregulation, something known as broad of course was introduced before uh, 1991 i'll just touch upon these uh, terms you know uh, broadbanding is you know earlier as you know there was a licensing part of it so i am given a license to manufacture uh, let us say uh, one lakh uh, tires truck tires now i find that there's not much of demand for uh, trucks and therefore i am not able to sell off these one lakh uh, tires that i can manufacture but there's a demand for, let us say, passenger cars or scooters. But because of the licensing provided that time, I have to produce only the truck tires and I cannot have a mix of either two-wheelers or four-wheeler tires, provided the number does not exceed one lakh. What the government did, they said, fine. Broadbanding was, you got license for one lakh. Now, within one lakh, how much you produce for the truck tires, how much you go for... Uh, say car tires and how much you produce uh, for the two wheelers will be entirely at your discretion earlier one lakh truck tires mean truck tires only no other product that is the rigidity part of it and liberalization is broadband so that was also adopted then you know when it's abolition of registration i am not talking of abolition of registration with the register of companies earlier if me as a private sector i have to come with uh, capital in the market then there was a government authority or government office known as controller of capital issues. So this particular uh, controller of capital issues, they will go for the IPOs and pricing. That particular uh, office itself was uh, abolished by the government. Then you will also find that uh, they wanted to actually control uh, the growth and facilitate growth and make Indian industry more competitive within the country also and global also that that's where the move come from sailors market to uh, buyers market and you know if you're into sailors market you don't really bother about the customer you don't bother about the price you don't bother about the technology in fact olden times we found that quite a few absolute technologies were passed on to the government at the current prices so that idea was competitiveness technology uh, kaizen as you call it and what the government did therefore was licensing, industrial licensing was abolished for all areas except 18 to start with. Now they have brought it down to only three and within that also they are slowly opening up defense also. They also talk about railways. So earlier licensing for every industrial activity now almost abolished except for three core sectors. Then at that point of time, you know, the, as I said, the thinking was basically uh, socialistic. So government felt that uh, you know, the big people like Tata's and Birla's and uh, Srinivasan's kind of thing, they will actually be cornering the industrial growth. So they government had made a rule. There's a limit, I mean, whatever threshold limit. You know, like if your total uh, worth is more than 50 crores, then you cannot go in for uh, new expansion or you not be given a new license. What happened after 91 was this threshold limit, which was 50 crores earlier, it was raised to 100 crores. Then it was raised to what is known as 200 crores. And subsequently, the limit itself was removed. That means any industry or any group now can go for uh, setting up of new units. Earlier, the perception was if only Tata, because they have got money, if Birlas, they have got money, if Amani, they have got money, they go on, then it will lead to skewed or monopolization of uh, industrial development. And therefore, the term was MRTP, Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act. This act itself was repealed and today uh, we have what is known as the competition commission of india idea is that there will not be any unhealthy competition but you will have to open up 
so today that 50 crores 100 crores and 200 crore threshold so basically the point is that because you got money or because you got resources or because you got wealth that will not be a constraint in your coming out with newer industries and actually contributing to india's industrial growth then you know they also as i said uh, 200 crore threshold that there was the threshold itself was removed then earlier there was a need that if i want to acquire some company then i had to get a clearance from mrdp because again there was a feeling that the moment i merge with company like you know suppose vodafone and idea want to come together or uh, in the past there was a talk that jet and kingfisher wanted to come together government said sorry because you know, this might lead to uh, monopoly kind of monopolistic kind of situation so we don't want this kind of things happen so earlier mrtp clearance was required now as a part of reforms this particular clearance which was required uh, was removed so the companies were free to go in for mergers and acquisition therefore you find after 91 if you look at there was you know there's a slew of uh, mergers acquisition across the industry not only it you name anything and you'll find quite a few things have actually uh, what you call uh, happened in terms of merger acquisition and then as i said mrtp uh, role was changed and now there is a competitive uh, what is the competition commission of india as a watchdog then we also find that in terms of industrial policy the areas as i said reserved for public sector were narrowed down and core sector also was opened up for the private sector initially uh, we had about uh, 17 reserve then from 17 the number was brought down to 8 it was brought down to 3 basically for defense defense production and railways was the last uh, remnants of public sector monopoly now you find even this talk of railways privatization icrtc is kind of thing some trains are actually being operated by private operators even in defense you find that some foreign uh, I mean, there are foreign uh, suppliers, they have entered into some private players in India. So, uh, in fact, LNT had big plans for entering into atomic energy, which was a typical uh, core part of it. That is still not happened. But, you know, idea is that everywhere now, private sector would be allowed to come in. So, you know, army, Colonel Zahab, if I may put it, so not only Shaktiman. Now, Mahindra will come in, Leyland will come in, and it is not necessary that all the guns are manufactured in Jabalpur only. So, that is a privatization and opening up of core sector as well. Then we'll find that, uh, that this investment, investment, of course, happened. Then another thing that happened was, as I said, uh, out of 236, 123 were contributing uh, public sector units. Out of these 123, 20 were contributing 80% and 100 were contributing 20% of profit. That means the remaining were basically a sick public sector units. In the olden times, the policy was that because they are public sector units, they were treated as what you call sacrosanct. They will not be closed down and they will not be referred to any other agency. The respective ministry, it could be railways, it could be steel, it could be defense. They will be supporting these loss making units. Now, the policy reforms was that these units also could be referred to a body known as BI, if I know, so, you know it's both for industrial finance and reconstruction. So, this is the only body that in India can actually allow the closure or rehabilitation part of it. Earlier, defense, I mean, public sector was out of it. Now, BIFR can look into these issues and actually can guide closure, which was not possible earlier. So, this is another reform that was uh, introduced as per the new industrial policy post-1991. As I said, you know, they were also given uh, part of reform. They were given professional uh, freedom and management. The idea was to help uh, enable them to be self-supporting and of course earn a reasonable profit. So 2% return is, you know, your peanuts actually, as you find. ROI, all those concepts, you know, you, you have those in finance, so I'm not going to, but those ROI and other things, everything was important. Then one thing more came for public sector units particularly was that each public sector unit was required to enter into a MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with their parent ministry and what they will do is they will set out clearly what is their present performance how do they propose to improve the performance what step they will be taking and actually they were given some target in terms of profit and performance improvement also so the memorandum of understanding set targets which the PSU had to achieve and 
the performance would decide whether the public sector will receive support or it will go to BIFR. So typically, you know, I mean, because we are looking from all these from the management uh, point of view, what was you know, what was attempted was that uh, there was an attempt to bring in what we call uh, management by objectives. And then actually we wanted to move one step further that rather than just MBO, because you can have objective without attaining it. So we want MOU, we wanted our objectives, but we also wanted what is known as management by result and uh, performance as you call it. So it was another reform which was brought as far as public sector units are concerned. Then of course, another thing that happened was uh, the priority or preferences given to public sector units uh, were uh, in tenders was abolished. That means, you know, you come to the market, if you're good, you are there. If you're not good, don't expect a uh, monopoly kind of thing. Then there was also agreed that there will not be any further expansion of existing public sector uh, equity. That is the government will not put in new additional money or the government will not set up new public sector undertaking. It was also agreed that the budgetary support from the uh, annual budget that the loss making units were given, that support was to be phased out. Idea was either you become self supporting or you are referred to BIFR and if you are not going to be a viable unit, it will be closed down. The government will not be bleeding because you are not able to perform. Then of course, uh, there was an act known as FERA, Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. This is also applicable to the foreign trade policy, but I am talking about from the industrial policy perspective. Now that point of time, you know, you were not allowed to bring in uh, what is known as FDI. You cannot employ a foreign technician or you cannot get foreign consultancy without getting the approval from the ministry concerned. And of course, the foreign exchange, you have to get approval from RBI. So with FERA liberalization, hello. In fact, uh, that FERA, you know, was replaced by FEMA, Foreign Exchange Management Act. We'll discuss that uh, maybe sometimes later. Right now, just appreciate that FERA, you know, if, if, I, if I may put it this way, FERA was supposed to be one of the most draconian act. So, you know, if, 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 if you have a few dollars with you, you can be prosecuted. You know, that's the kind of uh, draconian things uh, which are provided for. You cannot open a foreign account. If you have a number Swiss account, it was hushesh. Today, officially, you can purchase property. Officially, you can uh, actually remit uh, forex currency up worth about 2 to 2.5 lakh dollars every year from India. Officially, you can have property abroad. Officially, you can have uh, uh, investment abroad. Even Swiss account for that matter. But these are the things that happen. But they are more in domain of foreign exchange. So, I, from the industrial point of view, uh, remuneration in foreign exchange liberalized. Employment of foreign technicians liberalized. Bringing in uh, foreign uh, investment again liberalized. So, these were the basic reforms in terms of uh, what you call FERA as far as the industrial policy is uh, concerned. Then, obviously, after industrial policy, what we have is uh, the foreign trade policy. Adnan, we have time or we take a break? Uh, so we have about two minutes remaining. If you wish, we can take a break now and then start afresh. I think so because I'll not be able to you know, go into this. So what we'll do is we'll take a break now. And what time we start? Nine o'clock? Okay, sir. We'll start at nine o'clock. Okay, done. We take a break. 8.52, we start at nine. Thank you. great uh, social uh, event kind of thing. Pradesh, Prayan, they used to call it. And then, you know, that fellow will very arrogantly write to you what will you like, what you like him to bring. And the standard that will work out, brute, typical for people like us, after shave, and uh, there was a soap known as Kame, a big cake kind of thing. Today, what has happened is, if anybody, a lot of people are there today, you also travel a lot. So, if somebody asks you, what should I bring? You say, Baba, tu aja. We get everything out here. No, we are getting everything out here in India, thanks basically to the foreign trade uh, policy reforms which were initiated in 1991. And we have been benefited both at the individual level also, as well as uh, the corporate or the business uh, level also. So, typically, uh, what happened was, uh, as I said, 
like all industrial policy and finance sector policy, foreign trade policy also was reformed. The idea was basically uh, to give stimulus or to increase the exports and also for that amount of time uh, control imports and therefore uh, reforms were initiated. Basically what happened was we were allowed to import more freely and export more freely by reducing, I will not say minimizing, even today there are certain documentation and procedural part of it. But quite a few things today, you know, I mean, you can import very comfortably. In fact, today coming from abroad, that customs is no more a nightmare. It takes more time for you to get your luggage uh, from the belt where you are supposed to get it. If you really don't have anything substantial, you can simply walk through the green channel, as you call it. But olden times, everybody will take minimum two and a half to three hours for custom clearance, as we used to call it. So today, because of the uh, reforms, there are freer imports and exports. So basically, what happened was they tried to rationalize the import duties and custom duties. They were substantially reduced. Earlier, you know, because we didn't have money, and because we didn't, we were more into the self-reliance part of it. There were duties which were in terms of. Hello, hello. Just a disclaimer. Are you getting me? Are you getting me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Okay, fine. So you know, typically olden times there were uh, these income, this custom duties and import duties in the range of two fifty three hundred percent also. Today, you'll find that on an average, you'll find, you know, they have been substantially reduced. That is known as the tariff part of it. Otherwise, the quantity part of it, you can only bring so much. So there were two basic restrictions uh, in imports. One was known as quantitative. Second was known as the non-quantitative, that is tariff. Both these restrictions have been reduced. And today, you know, if you look at it, you will find that the peak rate of import was reduced from more than 300 to 150% to start with. Today, you find hardly... 25-30% duties are uh, currently being charged and obviously if, if the tariff is lower, people start bringing in more. Then, you know, uh, they also allowed basically to promote export, as I said, the government allowed export uh, houses uh, to be uh, set up. Export houses were basically firms which were exclusively looking after export of different uh, kind of items from India abroad. Like I remember Tata's, you know, they, Tata, there was a company known as Tata Exports. Now every Tata company exports, you know, like Telco or Tata Motors uh, will export, TCS of course they have, but earlier most of the products were routed through Tata Export because that was the export house. So a lot of these export houses were actually promoted so that these people are able to enter foreign market. Then the government also permitted setting up of trading houses with 51% foreign equity. Now, when I say 51, what I mean is majority foreign equity, which earlier was a taboo. The idea was you are already know what is the foreign market. You come to India, you set up a unit here and ultimately help us to promote export because foreign exchange, again, that point of time, even today it is important. That point it was more critical that our exports become more uh, vibrant. Then we also find, you know, there was uh, what the government came with a list, what, what is known as a, a specified list, as the government calls it, of high technology and high investment priority was announced. Priority means other things remaining equal. If there's a queue, you will come forward and you will be given uh, permission. Then there is also what is known as automatic route, as they call it. Automatic permission was granted for foreign direct investment to 51% foreign equity. Now, if you are bringing in majority 15 obviously majority control part of it so when sony wanted to come sony said fine we want to come but you know we don't want 51 percent we want 100 percent and sony was actually allowed to come with that kind of equity also then from 51 percent it was raised to 74 percent and today you find that uh, quite a few foreign companies have actually set up their units in india which are what you call wholly owned subsidiary as we call them in strategic management. So this is basically possible because the government has modified or reformed the foreign trade and foreign investment policy. Plus, as I said, there was a specified list. This list also has been subsequently increased. Now, just, just know for the sake of comparison, in the industrial policy, we said that the government has reduced the list or the industries included in the list where you required licensing and those kind of things. Here, 
the government is actually expanding the list where you can bring in investment one secondly the reform is that earlier you can invest 51% then it was raised to 74% now the government has also permitted 100% equity or fdi that's another reform that has been made in foreign trade policy then the government has also set up what is known as fipb or uh, known as foreign investment promotion board basically to negotiate with international firms and approve direct foreign investment in select areas i mean obviously the government doesn't want uh, the fdi and the foreign companies to come into everything and uh, you know which can have some kind of disruptive effect on the indian local industry so in certain select industries government is looking after what is known as expeditious clearance the government has also taken uh, steps to promote what is known as fii now so this is just a slight difference fdi is what fdi is where you bring in money and you actually set up a firm or a business so two things happen one you bring in money second you set up a firm and obviously when you set up a firm or factory like mercedes has come or uh, sony has come as i said or uh, you'll find ikea has come hyderabad for example they have come with fdi so when you come with fdi you not only get capital it also helps you to create employment FII is another ball game where the FII is more the money part of it, and this FII doesn't come into the industry; it comes more into the stock market or capital market. Earlier, capital markets were not allowed to entertain FII. Now the government has allowed FII. Also, idea is that I would get foreign investment so that the Indian capital market could further move ahead. Uh, if, if I may add, and I'll talk about it. Uh, indian companies are also allowed to access foreign uh, capital markets to mobilize funds we will we'll touch upon it uh, slightly later so fdi was well, allowed... uh, i had I, I had a doubt sir yeah uh, yes, sir, please, sir. Just, just a clarification is it possible for the government of india to restrict the entry of certain foreign players in unwanted fields you can actually uh, i hope this is reference with 5g Probably. Yeah, especially investment of I China in uh, HDFC. In fact, uh, now not only India, other governments have also started restricting uh, Chinese, particularly India. Uh, even UAE, you know, they were not; they were allowed only part uh, entry into the 5G uh, transactions. Totally, they are not; they are not banned it. So, government has a discretion because you know, even globally, uh, there is something known as national security considerations. and any government what us is doing although it's supposed to be one of the most open uh, kind of economy once upon a time us also is doing some restrictive practices mainly because of national security so even by wto caveat government of india is entitled and empowered to initiate uh, banning of some foreign players if it is considered undesirable from the national uh, security perspective kind of thing is that okay yes sir thank you sir okay fine uh, so basically uh, what happened was you know as, as part of this uh, now we want to promote exports so obviously you will promote export or people will purchase provided your products are competitively priced so what the government did way back in 91 it devalued the indian rupee because it was a general perception a fact actually that indian rupee rate was manipulated or artificially controlled like you know what i mean by this is uh, in 91 for example the rupee was about 20 rupees equal to 1 dollar now people feel that officially you might claim that uh, it is 28 rupees so if i am exporting i am getting 28 rupees if i am importing also i am getting 28 rupees so importers were happy but in the market people said that real rupees grossly uh, you know it is not 28 actually i should get 31 uh, rupees and what had happened was if i may uh, use that word this particular artificial uh, control and jacking up of uh, rupee prices had given rise to a very unhealthy practice known as hawala racket hawala means what you know there are a lot of monetary transactions where the transactions were not through the proper organized channels so the money will not come through banks to india it will come through other channels like you know uh, let us say i am i got a brother in the us and uh, he wants to remit say every month 1000 dollars to my parents so if he sends through the proper channel he will get uh, you know 1000 into 28 so 28000 minus maybe taxes 
as such is that some people will approach him they will say boss your money will be delivered in indian rupees no questions asked to the address and number that you give but at the rate of 31 so what happens was this 1000 rupees that was coming will go to that person and today if you look at it the kind of remittances that we are getting are a few billions but this money was channelized through some undesirable channels which was basically used for smuggling and therefore the government realized that this is something that hawala racket needs to be something that needs to be controlled and one of the ways was to devalue so what the government did first week they devalued the rupee that is it went from 28 to 13 rupees per dollar then again it went further to 33 that so two things happened one was if you are exporting for every dollar that you export you will be getting 33 rupees so you will be encouraged to export at the same time if you want to import something for every dollar of import you will have to pay 33 dollars so you know the government actually wanted to gain both ways on one side promote export because the indian exporter will be rewarded by 33 rupees on the other side reduce imports because the imports will actually be costing 33 rupees so what the government did was devalue the rupee in uh, 19 uh, july 1991 what is known as between the real and the market perception value then the rupee today is also made convertible on the current account current account means you know, you'll find that if you read the newspaper you find that it rupee has moved from 70 to 70 to 72 rupees or rupee has become stronger so you know from 70 that moved to 69 so this is where the government or the rbi doesn't play a role it has it has been left to the market mechanism that was a reform that the rupee dollar or rupee and foreign exchange rate parity is not now dictated or controlled or manipulated by the rbi it is left to the market uh, mechanism that was the reform that was brought in as far as forex rate was uh, concerned then as i said uh, the fipb was uh, also set up earlier we have seen now after these reform the government also focus on the reforms in the financial and i got deposits of 100 crores i can't give 100 crores as a loan right part of that has to be there so the there is a rule that uh, earlier there was a the rule that almost ar around 8% will be with rbi in terms of cash and around uh, 32% will be uh, with rbi in terms of what is known as statutory liquid ratio basically government investment uh, so it uh, roughly you know around 40 42% of the money that was with the bank was taken away by rbi and there were the banks were left only with uh, 60% uh, percent of the money deposit they have uh, i mean before i move further i just like to mention uh, one particular committee the committee is known as uh, narsimham committee okay there were two reports which were given by this committee and most of the banking sector reforms were initiated based on the recommendations of uh, the recommendations made by the narsimhan committee he was uh, ex finance secretary ex rbi governor also so a knowledgeable person he two committees there uh, it is known as narsimhan committee 1 and narsimhan committee 2 i will not go to details of that i'll just try to summarize uh, the recommendations and reforms initiated but these reforms please remember were basically based on the recommendations uh, made by the narsimhan committee report in their report 1 and report 2 so first thing that was done was uh, the crr and slr limit was reduced the idea was that the bank should get more uh, money with them and obviously you know if i am having 60 rupees or i am having 75 rupees obviously i will be able to give more loan idea was if you are able to give more loan that 1 rupee you know in banking we say there's a multiplier effect so if i take a loan of 1 rupee i don't keep the money with me part of that i give to my contractor part of that i go for land part of that uh, my vendor so this actually 1 rupee becomes 5 rupees that is on a multiplier effect so idea was if banks start giving loan it will accelerate the pace of economic development also so crr srr limit was uh, brought down idea was bank should have more money and they should be able to give more loans then of course uh, there was something known as priority sectors basically what it means is that earlier you know uh, banks you discuss more about the banking in the sector the sector b part of it where you got banking and uh, it and those kind of things if i cover i touch upon this factor but just remember that if me as a banker i am giving 100 crores 
particularly public sector bank, the rule was that 40 crores of these 100 crores must go to agriculture, small industries and small business, which was known as uh, priority sector. Uh, so first you take care of these 40 percent, then give others to industry and trade and those kind of things. What the committee said, the reform was that this, the government did not officially made it because that will be you know politically uh, damaging. So damaging. the government has agreed in principle that the priority sector will progressively be brought down from 40% to 25%. That means the priority, priority sector, the interest rate was lower, say 8%, 7%, that point of time I'm talking about. Uh, so if I'm giving loan to industry, as, as a banker, I can tell you this, you know, that we used to charge 18% plus to some of our major clients who typically industry is to guard. So that means I would be able to give this extra 15% to companies at a higher rate that hopefully should add to my profit. That was the idea. Then earlier, uh, as you might be aware, uh, that the RBI used to decide the rates both on advances, that is loans, as well as deposits. In fact, till recently, some of you might be aware that uh, savings bank, you were not getting a rate of more than 4%. Recently, the savings bank rate also has been deregulated. So you'll find that Kotaki there, then Yes Bank, not a very good name to talk about these days, but Yes Bank was the first bank who said, okay, we'll give you 6% interest on savings bank because the RBI removed their control. So basically what happened was earlier the RBI will say, okay, you got FD for one year, you will give 8%. You got FD for two years, you will give 8.5%. You got recurring deposit for five years, you will give 9%. So these rates, both, I repeat, on deposits and loans were decided by RBI. As per the new reform policy in banking, the this particular what you call cap or upper limit or regulation actually was removed and the banks were given the freedom that they will decide what interest rates they want to give on recurring deposits, on fixed deposit, what interest rate they want to charge to say Bajaj Auto or to a small uh, industry or to IT firms. So the term is that the interest rates were deregulated. As you said in the, you know, initially we moved from regulation to deregulation. This is part of the liberalization where RBI said, okay, 91 and 92, I said, they said only saving bank account 4%, not negotiable, but other you can decide. So that was another reform brought in. Plus there was also operational freedom uh, as to which areas, which clients you will prefer. That was also given to bank. So early it was all fixed and directed, directed. That was the important part of it. In fact, dictated at times. So this operational leverage was also given to the banks, which was again part of the reforms policy. Then uh, for the first time, we started talking about what is known as uh, international norms, what is known as the prudential norms, as we call it, uh, which are given by the Bank for International Settlement. Uh, some of you might have heard the term Basel 1 and Basel 2 and Basel 3 norms. Narsimhan committee was the one who said that, look, the banks must be financially strong and for this purpose, they must have appropriate capital adequacy ratio. They must have good capital also. Then banks were having a lot of what is known as uh, bad loans. But officially, banks were allowed not to declare them. Please appreciate this. Huh? Me as a bank, let us say I got 1000 crores which are not going to come back. So it's a bad loan. But 92, till 92, 93, 94 actually, you will find that if you, if you go through some old uh, bank uh, balance sheet, there was an entry, you know, debts considered bad or doubtful. The word NPA was not there that, that part of Doubtful means bad debt, they are not going to recover. So officially in the bank's balance sheet, they will say that debts considered bad or doubtful, nil this year, nil last year also. So officially they were not publishing it or officially they were allowed not to state what are the bad debt with them. Although there were almost 10, 15 percent, as a banker, I can tell you, I've been part of that mechanism. So I can tell you that almost, almost 10 to 12 percent was the standard bad debts, but they were not allowed. So provision was not being made. That means the profit you are showing were cooked up or fudge. So the reform was that the capital adequacy ratios were introduced. Then you have to strengthen your capital base known as recapitalization that was brought in. Then you have to specify which, in, which accounts are good because if the accounts are good, you will get uh, income. Otherwise, you'll only notionally say accrued, which you'll never get. So all these were brought in for uh, 
the improvement of the quality of bank lending as you call it then the government also started what is what i said earlier disinvestment so state bank in fact in technically state bank was owned by rbi now it is owned by the government of india part of the state bank is owned by people like us so it was disinvestment then you know you'll be surprised but the banks were not allowed to decide where they will open branches they actually could not locate a branch within 400 meters of if there's already a branch existing like you know for example if there's a bank of maharashtra uh, in university then uh, state bank cannot come and open a branch uh, within 400 meters that was part of it i i was looking after branch expansion in ahmedabad so we have gone through all these games as we call it now what rbi did they allowed as i said uh, this operation freedom banks were allowed to open the branch without first seeking license branch can decide that okay this branch is not doing very well in um, say university area so i like to move to own that relocation also was allowed earlier that was not allowed without rbi then the bank cannot be closed now a branch has the authority a bank has the authority to close or uh, the bank branch also so typical reform was you can open the branch on your own you don't have to get rbi license first you decide and then you get a license permission was not required post facto yes but not before then you can relocate the branch and you can also close the branch if you feel it is not viable uh, you know i mean this part of uh, actually nothing to do with this but reform that uh, let me share this with you no i had when i was in state bank yes, i had undertaken a study uh, uh, you know the study very interesting it was known as branches open after 1969 and working in continuous loss for the last 5 years just think of it that means it was common for the because once you open a branch whether it is earning or not you had no choice but to keep on grading so this particular reform was that if a branch is not doing well either you relocate at some other place where there is better potential or if the branch cannot be viable simply close it down that was the reform then of course as i said uh, for the first time they brought in this idea that uh, there should be you know what you call five or seven all india branches then there should be another uh, five or uh, six regional what you call western western zone or southern zone or eastern zone kind of branches banks and therefore they said that there is no need for all the what you call 28 uh, banks in india because in 28 banks mean 28 uh, ceos 28 Integrated headquarters. Then every bank will have its own uh, uh, duplication also. So they said that needs to be uh, what you call brought together. And today you will find, you know, from first of April you will find the number of public sector banks has been substantially reduced. Uh, I was in the state bank. You know, in state bank we had uh, what is known as subsidiary. So there was state bank of Travancore, state bank of Hyderabad. I'm sure some of you must have heard of this state bank of Patiala. Patiala, yes. some people. We are aware in a different context, but I am talking of State Bank of Patiala. Okay, so we had State Bank of Patiala, State Bank of Bikaner, and Jaipur. Today, you will find that there is no such bank. There were seven such banks plus State Bank. Now, you will find that there is only State Bank of India, and all these State Bank of Patiala, Bikaner, Mysore, Indore, Saurashtra, then Hyderabad, Travancore. They are all merged into State Bank to form one bigger entity. you also find you know that syndicate bank for example is being merged with syndicate bank corporation bank is being now merged with canara bank i'm sure you must have heard of it punjab national bank is getting other so typically today you find you not be having more than 7 to 8 branches in merger acquisition that was another reform that was uh, brought in plus we had uh, some sir, private sir uh, a point sir yes please You are uh, you being from the banking se- sector. You were talking about bad debts. Huh. So a particular account before it turns into a bad debt, it it passes through the phase of your internal audit. That is the internal banking audit. Then it uh-huh. passes through it passes through the IBC. It passes through the huh. NCLT, and then hmm. what happens is the is the. Uh, Are recoveries made, or is it written as an NPA and uh, the loss borne by the bank? See, if it is written off, it will be the loss borne by the bank, and ultimately it will go from the P&L account. Okay. Now, so, all this. Uh, uh, how is how is that happening? Off. In the sense, no, no. See, uh, 
we have big industrialists who have taken huge loans over hmm. over a period of time if it is hmm. written off as a bad debt aren't they aren't they hmm. uh, benefiting they are benefiting see that is why now see earlier there was no uh, ibc code right yes sir what you mentioned about ibc or insecurity these are all typical post 1991 reform ibc code was not there there is also another act known as surface act which was not there there are 201 202 203 204 so earlier what happened you know actually i i share this with you earlier in fact there were people who were willful defaulters because they knew that if i don't pay off the bank whatever amount is not material if i don't pay the bank the bank can only go for a civil suit and there were you know there were years first i had to issue the account has to be sick for two years then i'll issue a legal notice then again internally before it becomes a bad debt it is on a protested account actually then we'll file a civil case it will go for n number of years so that time actually people were interested in the bank going against them legally because then there are the guarantees that they don't have to pay because the court will not come with a verdict so now the reform is they got what is known as a tribunal dispute uh, trade debt uh, tribunal debt settlement tribunal they have got uh, compromise court they have got log adalat we'll talk about this when we talk of npa in the banking part of it but today i'll tell you bad debts were there to, there was no income recognition part of it it was decided at the discretion of the senior executives of the bank now the rbi has given what is income if today you know normally you find that if the account is overdue for more than 90 days then it is to be considered as an npa earlier this particular guideline for income recognition and classification of the account was not there and as far as the auditors are concerned let me tell you don't take audit reports so seriously unfortunately because otherwise in pune you know there's a bank known as rupee bank what happened to rupee bank would not have happened if audit was diligent what happened to yes bank it is not that audit was not carried out in fact you know like in the us there were something like socks where the auditors are now made accountable now you will find that the auditors role also is being challenged in case of satyam it was challenged again both banks so we'll we'll talk about that when we talk of banking sector in the second section i would like to say earlier there was no structured way of income recognition earlier there, there was no structured way of as a bad debt it means that you the RBI has come out with guidelines to which account is to be classified as a bad debt. How much provision has to be made? There is something known as standard account, substandard account, bad account. So 100% provision, which again will go directly to PL part of it. I hope I have answered your query. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. We'll, I, I repeat again. We'll talk about this when we talk of banking in detail uh, in other other section because Mr. Raval may not be conducting those the second section. I'll be conducting it there. I'll come to this. in more detailed manner just bear with me till that time okay can i move further yes sir absolutely thank yes, you yes sir okay thank you so uh, yeah sorry somebody has a question uh, yes i have a question sir ha huh. uh, so the question is that uh, rbi we all know is an autonomous body uh, but to huh. better a bank being under rbi or a bank being under the government of india from your no, the no, technically technically it is the rbi that controls the banking sector the problem is rbi is controlled by the government you know what i mean yes sir partially <laughs> so this is where you know this is what you call i have given a tactical answer okay so that happens otherwise you know i mean you must have heard what is known as phone banking the so phone banking would not have happened and uh, you know somebody would not have been given a 900 crore loan uh by keeping a bird which doesn't fly as a security you know what i mean brand name just brand name yes okay i agree so uh and then as i said you know they also brought in uh, professionalization i mean you know training was given big big uh, boost professional training i'm talking about then the banks were also uh, allowed or actually encouraged to go for uh, technology again you know just uh, as i said because uh, i had been working with the bank uh, hey, how many minutes we have 5 minutes okay uh, so okay i'll come back to this down the line so there was you know basically computerization and that point of time 90s 84 actually started 84 there was a committee which, which was named as uh, 
committee to look into competition the committee's name had to be changed to mechanization because of the opposition from the union so that that was the situation in the banking fine so technology competition was actually allowed uh, core sector banking retail banking universal banking new product customized product as you call it uh, have been brought in we'll talk about these more in detail in the banking part of it so there are also uh, this is the question that you had asked fast track debt recovery mechanism for npa recovery has been initiated which was not there earlier so you got terminals you got uh, bankruptcy code you got uh, surveyor act I'll, I'll give a detailed note about NPA. I, in fact, mail it to you today itself so that if those who are interested can go through this. Then, uh, you know, if, if I may put it this way, typical reforms are banks are moving away from plain vanilla lending to commerce and industry, diversification, new products. And today you'll find, thanks to the reforms policy that we have, we say that it is not just a bank. That means, you know, you are not just accepting deposits and giving loans. That is the basic function earlier. Today, you will find that it is not just a bank. It is now a one-stop financial services super shop. And services means, you know, you want leasing? Yes, I'll provide. You want higher purchase? I'll provide. You want consultancy? I'll provide. You want merchant banking? I will provide. So basically what has happened, thanks to the reforms and the ecosystem that has been now created, banks are moving from just a deposit and lending institution to what is known as financial services super shop. And I think that is probably one of the biggest impact of the reforms on the banking industry. Plus, there are reforms in terms of quality of the loans because of the measures that have been initiated by the government. Idea is, you know, you should be globally competitive. So we are now very much into what we call uh, the BIS, Bank for International Settlement Vessel Norms, Capital Adequacy Norms, and prudential norms is also part of the reform which were not there earlier okay now uh, insurance sector reforms we'll talk uh, in the next session so so far i hope you are clear about the reform brought in industry and uh, banking idea was to make them competitive idea was to make them uh, basically viable and performance and result oriented and i think that's what professional management is about you know as we normally say in typical management cliche uh, deliver or be delivered, perform or perish, or execute or be executed. Now, this was the kind of uh, professionalism or professional thinking that was brought in with focus not only on objectives, but with focus on what we call management by result and management by performance. Plus, being competitive was one of the most important underlying philosophy of the whole reform process. We'll talk about insurance, capital market, and money market in the next session. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Shaka. Bye-bye. Take care. Good day. Thank, Thank you. you.